Hey guys, as promised, today I'm going to do a video about how to prepare and process bulk substrate. Uh, for those of you who don't know what bulk substrate is, it's the, the final stage of a process of the expansion of mycelium, starting out on very tiny amounts on petri dishes, moving all the way up through jars and then spawn bags up to bulk substrate, which is the final step from which we fruit our mushrooms. The way I do it is um, I mix sawdust and soybean hulls. This is commonly known in the community as master's mix, which is a coin termed by the guy who developed the substrate recipe. It's uh, T.R. Davis at Earth Angel Mushrooms out in the States. He's a legendary mushroom grower. Um, highly recommend going and checking out his channel. Um, a lot of the videos that you'll see of people preparing substrate online, um, they have lots of big machinery, they'll have like mix, back, batch mixers and um, you know, dry baggers, wet baggers, all sorts of different machinery. Um, I'm not at that point yet. I literally just have a bucket, a spade and a hammer and a chisel and you know, just a bit of time and a bit of elbow grease. So uh, you know, for those of you who are just starting out or maybe you know, thinking, looking for a way to easily do sort of smaller, smaller batches, you might get a little bit of value out of this. So as I've mentioned in a few of my other videos, I'm using hardwood fuel briquettes. Now they, they are really good. Uh, the, they're really good value, really um, good quality as well. Um, it's pure oak, the ones that I use anyway. Problem with it is, is there, it's a, quite a bit of extra work to process them. I think if I had like a cement, cement mixer or something like that, it might be a little bit easier. But um, you know, I've, I've done, I've done over, you know, a th you know, I've done thousands of blocks now uh, with this technique. So it's not the most efficient way of doing it. But if you're like me and all you have access to is a is a tub and a spade, then you know, watch on and you might be able to learn something. So for me, the main thing with bulk substrate is that you need to start with the end in mind. And what I mean by that is you need to be thinking about when you're in the lab inoculating these bags, you've got open cultures lying around and, you know, it's a very sensitive process where mistakes can lead to, you know, big costs months down the road. So you need to get this, you need to get this right. And the best, the best thing that you can have in the lab is clean, dry, crisp bags that are easy to seal um, and easy to work with and easy to process in the lab. So there's a whole list of steps that leading up to that point that are going to help you. you know, there's all sorts of problems that you might not see while you're preparing the substrate, but when you get into the lab, you'll just be pulling your hair out, you've got substrate, sawdust flying everywhere. You've got cultures spinning left, spilling left, right, and centre, and you know you're just having a hard time. Like when I first started doing this, doing batches of bulk, like inoculating big batches of bulk substrate was the most frustrating thing in the world. Um, you know, I was just pulling my hair out. Like, but you know, but slowly over time, I found you know I, I could see what was going wrong. There was a particular crease in the bag, or you know, I had a bit of a bit of sawdust stuck at the point where I was trying to seal it you know, too much moisture, too little moisture. Um, and over time, you, you just, you get a kind of a feel for it. Um, you know, there are things that you can do right now when you start to process your bulk substrate that are gonna benefit you later on down the line when, uh, when you're in the lab inoculating the bags. So the main things that you're trying to achieve here, once you've decided on your recipe, and there's lots of different recipes. Uh, like I said, I use this 50-50 um, sawdust soybean hull mixture. You can go sawdust and wheat bran. That, that's another good one that I've used a lot. I think most people, and for what I've used as well, you know, tend to be about 20, 10 to 20 percent wheat bran, depending on what you want. The general rule for me is: the less clean your working environment, the less supplementation you should add to your blocks. So, my advice would be that if you're in anything less than, you know, a, a really good clean lab when you're doing your inoculations. With a, with, a, you know, with a HEPA filter, uh, laminar flow cabinet and all that good stuff. I wouldn't recommend supplementing at 50% like I do here. I would recommend going a little bit lower. Your, colonization times, your colonization times will be slower, but you'll be, you know, you'll be safer from co contamination. And you really don't want contamination, especially not after you've slaved away like you're about to see doing this now. It is, uh, it is tragic, trust me. 
So the main thing that you're trying to get right is the, is the moisture content. This is really the key to getting the good bulk substrate. You want to get to what's known as field capacity, which is the maximum amount of water that the substrate can hold naturally before it starts pooling up in, or draining away. Um, I think this probably comes from, um, you know, it's a, it's a term used in agriculture when they're, you know, they're testing, the, um, testing the water retention in the soil. Uh, there's the classic test that you can do by um, picking up a handful and giving it a squeeze to see if the drips come out. We'll, we'll go through that in a bit. Um, but the reason why you want it here is because too little, too little moisture content in your bulk substrate will result in slower colonisation times and, and lower yields. Because if you think about it, um, a mushroom fruiting body is made up of, I think it's, it's 80 or 90% water, I, I can't remember which, but... That is a lot of water and that water has to come from somewhere so it's being drawn out through the substrate in the bag and um, sent to the growing mushrooms so if there's not enough water content in in those bags then you know you're not going to get as big full tender beautiful mushrooms too much moisture content in your bulk substrate which is a, a much worse you, you're better off being too dry than too wet results in, you, you, bas you basically suffocate the mycelium, um, you kind of drown it um, in, in the water. It also greatly increases your risk of contamination also, um, because all that water creates, you have like water pockets, um, it sort of all pulls up around the bottom, which just creates uh, a breeding ground for all sorts of other moulds and, and things that you don't want in there. And so the other thing that I really like to look out for with my bulk substrate bags is, is how the bags are packed and folded and how they go into the, into the barrel. Uh, steriliser. Now the, ma the main thing that you're looking for here is it's it's impossible to get this completely right but you want to um, you want to make sure that there isn't an excessive amount of substrate up the, up the sides of the bags um, and I've got a few a few ways that you know help help to keep the keep the tops of the bags clean. The other thing that you want is for the the tops of the bags to uh, to fold down nice and crisp as well uh, and there's, there's a bit of a learning curve and a bit of a technique with, with that also but that that helps that also helps when you're in the lab um, helps the bags seal um, but I'll, I'll, you know I'll, sh I'll show you all this as we go through so let's get started okay so this is our bucket that we're going to use this is one of these uh, supposedly supposedly indestructible gorilla tubs but um, I question that fact <laughs> this one has definitely seen better days but um yeah here we go so we uh, come over to the pallet here where we've got our briquettes uh -huh. and so we just want to select i'm going to take 12 this time uh pure oak they are just um pressure they're compressed with them uh, in some kind of a pressure machine so what, what, what's good about that is that they are actually sort of pre pre sterilized um, which is it's like an extra level an extra level of sterilization um, which is good um, but let's get these in the in the pot and move on okay so let's have a look we're still rolling yet so for the next step I use this advanced piece of machinery it's a kettle um, and so the idea of this is we want to soak, uh, soak the briquettes and rehydrate them. So if you can kind of see, I've got them all on their side here. So when the, when the water goes in, it helps it penetrate. If they're like this, this side is actually a lot, um, it's like smoother. It's, uh, that, that would have been like the outside from the, um, the pressurization process. Um, so the water can't get in it e as easily on that side as it can on this side. So I found they, they break up quite a lot easier this way so you just want to slowly pour it on just like this um, and then unfortunately there's actually a hole in this bucket Delilah we um, and yeah we will lose a little bit of the water out of the bottom but that's fine indestructible buckets eh should take it back really Um, but you should be able to see them sl starting to expand there now um, and usually wh while that's going I'll usually uh, fill up another kettle and um, I'll probably do, do three kettles on that. Clap! You don't need to say clap do you? But Ok, 
kettle number two is done. In we go. You see they've probably uh, expanded a fair bit there. Um, you want to make sure that you actually pour it over like each of the briquettes. Um, because actually uh, like pouring onto them, it does, it does, it does help. Um, you don't want to be in a situation where you're sitting here for an hour just breaking it apart by hand. Um, there's always going to be some big chunks in there afterwards, but... There we go, that's kettle number two. Kettle number three. Uh, so I should probably mention that um, the reason I use the boiling water as well is it's, um, it's, it's ten times better at rehydrating these. You can, you can try it with cold water, but you'll, you'll probably just need to leave them leave them to soak overnight or something. Um, and I just do not have time for that. But you can probably see, see that they're sort of slowly starting to expand there now. Um, it will probably do one more kettle, kettle number four. This is the last one now. As you can see, they've, uh, they've broken up quite nicely. Um, now, usually, uh, I have to get the hammer and chisel out uh, to break them apart a little bit, but these ones look like they've come apart really quite easily, actually. So, for all my complaining, <laughs> it actually seems to have gone pretty well this time, but... So let's see, we'll get the spade out. Okay, spade time. So. Let's get in there and see. So I can already tell it's not completely. Okay, so what I tend to do now is get the hammer and chisel out. Um, and you'll find that despite the soak, you've still got big bits like this. I mean, some of them will come apart. I mean, that one's come apart pretty nicely, actually, looking at it. Uh, I don't know if you can see that from there, but, you know, you sort of just have to get your hands in there and uh, break it up, really. But you kind of have to just go through the entire bucket like this. Um, and for the particularly stubborn ones, you've got the hammer and chisel, so I'll try and find a good example of that. Again, you know, it should all break up in your hands. I mean, you know, it's 20 minutes of doing this. It'd be nice to have a machine to do it, but, you know, it's good to get your hands dirty sometimes. This is probably incredibly boring. Gripping stuff. Um, yeah, when it gets down to stuff like this, I mean, just don't worry about it too much. It'll it'll get mixed in the end. There you go. It's basically a full a full brick still there. So here's a great example that won't go apart by hand. So um, again. In the side there, and then get your hammer and chisel out. And sorry, microphone, probably clipped, clipped to the meters. But, um, it's okay. And then, so you can kind of grab it like that, and then with the claw of the hammer, just smack it. Um, that's going to need more water, definitely. So that's about as much as we're going to get it there. Okay, so uh, one thing I've been doing slightly differently lately is um, I would usually do it in four batches, one in each of these buckets. Um, It'd be really good to just do it all in one big container, but I, I haven't been able to find anything suitable, unfortunately. So now what I've been doing is just, I spread the whole lot out on these uh, Corex sheets. This is yet another uh, use for Corex, it's corrugated plastic. Uh, it's worth doing a video on its own right, but you know, you just grab it and, and spread it out. Once you've got it to this point, um, and you, you'll see, you, know, you can see we've got quite a few big lumps of that still, but that's okay. 
And again, I'm sure you could just leave it to soak overnight, but you know, I, I, I have trouble, I've tried that and I've had trouble draining the water away and then ended up with, um, you know, it's too, it's too much water in the, in the substrate then. Um, I mean, the, the hardwood fuel pellets, the, the reason why people use them is that they can actually go into the bags dry. So you can just, you know, if you've got pellets of hardwood fuel pellets and soybean hull pellets, you can just mix those 50-50, get, you know, figure out your measurements, add your pellets, add your water, and then it all just mixes inside the bag, which is, which is much easier. But um, finding, although Gareth Archer did send me a link to um, some hardwood fuel pellets online, so I might, I might look into that, but, you know, it, they're, they're still cheap, but, you know, they're quite a bit more expensive still than, than these briquettes. I think it was like... 190 pounds for 900 kilos of these briquettes so um, you know so you know you do do what you can with your hands and then you know whatever whatever's left afterwards you can just you just pour more water onto it fun times <sighs> So trusty hose, get it on the right setting, and we're just going to soak these top blocks. Until they uh, start to fall apart, let's change the setting on that, I think that's better. Now I must mention a good thing to have here would be like a flow meter, so you can measure exactly how much uh, how much water that you've got going in. Um, I don't have that. Um, I just like using the hose, so I'm just I just go by um, you know just go by the way it feels. You can kind of you kind of get a sense of how much water that you need to add. And you see that's that was enough enough water then to break that break that down. Um, you know, and this isn't a, a good, efficient, or a smart way of doing this. Probably, um, you know, if anybody's got any ideas, I'm, I'm really open um, because you know it takes it takes a lot of time doing this. Um, but you know, for me at the moment, this is you know the best way I've got of doing it. Um, you know, an upgrade, a good thing to have would be um, like just a big trough of some kind to do it all in. Um, and then have a, um, a flow meter uh, with a, with a well, attached to the, uh, I think you can get them go uh, attached onto hoses. They have like a solenoid valve and it, you can type in the amount of water um, and it'll, you know, it'll shut it off once, once the correct amount of water has been applied. Um, these, these are all things that I'm planning to upgrade to in the, new in the near future, hopefully. But like, if, you know, if you're doing this at home, you know, you could easily do this out in your garden. You could probably even do this on the lawn. There's no reason why not. Um, you know, it'll give. You know, if you spray too much water on the, wa the water, will be able to drain through and go down into the grass. Um, I wouldn't worry about getting a bit of dirt in there either. Like, you know, this this batch that I'm doing here today, um, it's enough to do like uh, I think about 18 18 blocks. Uh, which, if you you know, if you're growing at home, that's you know, that's a lot of blocks. If you do this once a week, you know, that's more than enough mushrooms for you know for you to eat maybe even for like a whole family i often find it amazing that in such a short period of time these uh fungi can turn this stuff into delicious mushrooms you know in like three three or four weeks time you know you're gonna have mushrooms growing out of this it's just absolutely amazing there's always one last uh, stubborn little bit at the end. Um, my good buddy, uh, Bob Jones, who's been helping me out kindly um, the last couple of weeks, will tell you that. <laughs> he knows, this is, this is for you, my friend. <coughs> Shout out to Bob Jones, by the way. He's been an absolute star helping me out the last, uh, last few weeks. He's an absolute machine. Um, you know, there's a... One thing that I can recommend to, to people, it's to get uh, slave labour, basically. 
Uh, it's really good value for money and, um, you know, it's a very effective, very effective thing for your business. Okay, yeah. Give it a bit of a spray down. And then the idea now is that you want, if there's any chunks still, you want to try and bring them up to the surface. So we'll spread it out. Because there will still be chunks in there, I absolutely guarantee it. Okay. Now, I tend to try and find the chunks, spray them. Oh, we need a different setting for this. Yeah, yeah, spray the chunks. So you can destroy. Just a bit of a sp general spray down. There we go. Okay. Now, don't worry if you um, get a little bit past field capacity at this stage, because uh, you still need to add your, your supplementation, uh, which is dry. Um, it's actually, you can, you can actually go past field capacity with the sawdust, um, which helps breaking these down a little bit. Um, I haven't done that here, so I've, I've, I've needlessly struggled really, but um, yeah, that's kind of, that's my style. But yeah, you know, like the whole, the whole point of this is to show that you know you don't need you don't need all of this machinery. You like, you really really don't. Would it be nice? Yes, of course it would. And at some point, I'm definitely going to go there. But you know, it can be quite daunting when you when you see all of this stuff and you're like, oh my god, I need a batch mixer and a bagger and all these things. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is create a bit of a um, make it make like a bowl, and in this bowl. We're going to put our supplementation of choice, which in this case is uh, soybean hulls. All right, so I'm going to measure out my soybean hulls, and um, so generally, I add. Um, four kilograms of soybean hulls for every 12 briquettes. Um, seems to be a good amount. It's like a little bit less than 50-50. Uh, so that goes in there. So then we add that in the middle here. So now we want to spray the soybean hulls and get them hydrated as well. So I tend to just give them a good spray, uh, leave it for a few minutes to, uh, to absorb, then mix it all together. And then it's just a case of um, spraying down, mixing, spraying. Um, like the first few times you do it, you'll, you'll add a little bit and then test it and a little bit and test it a little bit. That's the right way. Just take your time because it's much harder to take the moisture out than it is to add it in. And again, there are better ways to do this with flow meters and everything, you know, you can be more, more scientific with it, but this is just me doing it, you know, this is the most basic possible way, really, of, do, of doing this. All right, so you can probably see this, the same with the, um, same with the, uh, the briquettes. The, uh, the, the pellets are basically just tiny briquettes. Um, they, they start to, uh, start to plump up once they, once they start to absorb the water. And you see these are, you know, they're nearly there. Um, you know, it's still still dry on the inside, so I think we'll add a little bit more water. Of course, it does it does take time. Okay, so I think we'll give this a mix round now, and we're going to mix it all together. And 
first you want to just do this you know a little increment at a time and keep testing it and when you get better at it you'll you'll, you'll get a sense and you'll, you'll of uh, how much water needs to be added and you'll do it quicker so So give it a test. Nope, not there yet. I can tell that's really close now, just from looking at it. There'll be a point if you can see that okay yeah so there'll, there'll be a point where you can see the uh, the soybean pellet or whatever sort of pelletized supplement you're using I guess it'd be the same for the hardwood as well they just they completely break apart and you'll, you'll, you won't see as many of the lighter colored bits um, still not quite there yet but it's close So uh, we're now taking bets to see if I actually overwater this or not. So th it was, I should say really, th uh, this pot is crucial now because it would be very, very easy to overwater it, right? Um, so if you're not sure, just add a little bit, test it again, add a little bit more, test it again until you're perfect. Okay, I think that might be there now. Give it the squeeze test, let's just make sure. Oh, sugar, oh dear. Whoops. Uh, we've got a bit of battery left. Right, okay, so you can see that. See just a few drops coming out. Yeah, there we go. For that last one, we had just a few drops coming out, so. Yeah, there you go, you see that? Just a little bit coming up, I'm squeezing it as hard as I can. That whole pile is at field capacity. All right, so I'm now gonna clear a little area for me to bag. I actually have a little bit left over from the other day which I'm gonna to add to it as well. I run out of bags on Monday and this is left over. Uh, so I should say a quick note about the, uh, the field capacity test that I just showed you how to do it there. There are more scientific and accurate ways of doing it um, where, where you, um, you can weigh the difference between, um, you can add water uh, and dry it out and, and weigh the difference. Personally, I, I, I've never done it. Um, what I will say is that the, the way that I just showed you is, is definitely sufficient for, for most people's uses. Um, unless you're you know, running things on a massive scale um, and like those tiny you know, margins are um, you know, important to you. And they might be important to you anyway. Uh, they are to me, it's just I, you know, I haven't got to that, got round to it yet. Um, you know, for most people, uh, that's fine. You know, I would always just you know, err on the side of being too dry rather than too wet. That's really important. You know. There's not quite enough water, you know. I could have maybe had, I could get away with two, three, even four liters less than what I put in there. Um, it's going to be fine, you know. The worst is going to happen is, um, you know, you're going to be a slightly slower on your colonization, and uh, you know your mushrooms aren't going to be quite as big. But you will still have mushrooms if you add too much water and it gets contaminated. There's no mushrooms at all. So, um, especially when you're first starting out, just you know, err, err on the side of uh, less moisture rather than more. Okay, so here we are, ready to uh, bag up our substrate. Um, the bags that we're using are these. Um, they are Unicorn 3TL bags. Um, I ordered them from Glückspils in Austria. Uh, they are still delivering at the moment, by the way. It's only in boxes of a thousand. Um, but yeah, they're, they're really good. They're really good, basically. Um, they have these, these gussets on the side. 
like this. And um, that's really good because it, um, it allows the bag to create, it, it self seals once it cools after it's been in the, uh, been in the steriliser, uh, which is really good because um, while it's cooling down in the steriliser, which you can see over there, um, if, they, if the bags don't self seal, they, they will pull dirty air inside the bag as, as they cool down, rendering the whole process useless. Um, the problem with the gusset is that when you are, if you're using an impulse sealer, um, the way that they're folded means that you have to make sure that these bags come out of the steriliser still fully intact. You don't want them to have warped or stretched because that's going to create little air pockets um, where, where the seal should happen and you're not, you know, not going to get a perfect seal. Um, so there's a lot of things that I'm doing here in this process now to prevent that from happening. Uh, the other bit I should mention as well is that you don't want to have, so your substrate's going to come up to about here. Um, I'm filling them up to two and a half kilograms wet, which is a good amount for these bags. It's probably a little bit overfill, but you know, I'm trying to get, get the most out of my, um, you know, out of my setup. Substrate's going to come up to about here. You want to try and keep the top of the bag as clean as you possibly can. Now, all right. <laughs> When I first started packing these bags, I, I had all kinds of struggles getting them to stand up and, oh God, it, you know, it was an absolute nightmare until in my kitchen cupboard, I found one of these, which is just a, uh, a basic, you can get them from like Tesco's or wherever. It's just a, a, a plastic chopping mat, um, like a chopping board for vegetables. Um, and it's the perfect size to fit into these bags. So the first step is to open up your bag Get your arm in there, and again, try not to stretch. Just try not to stretch the plastic so you can keep that crisp shape to the bag. Um, so you can pick this up, so you have your bag in one hand, you can pick this up with the other hand, fold it, put it against your leg or whatever, or a chair or something. You can fold it and then hold it like this, pop it in your bag, and then let go. And then you can hold your bag from there. And now what this allows you to do is, I hope you can see this all right, is you scoop. Now for me, um, nine big scoops usually equates to two and a half kilos. We'll weigh the first one just to calibrate you know, my sense here. And then I'll, the rest of them, I, I won't bother weighing then because they don't need to be 100% you know, accurate. So, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight and then nine okay so now at this point shake it all down and then pull this out you'll always get a bit of debris but make sure that this dirty side stays dirty and this side stays up so i usually just pop it i'll pop it on my lap here ready, ready to grab again for the next one and then with your bag um i should probably do that over this side so i'm going to pop this down clean side keep the clean side clean so with your bag, you probably see that better now. Just you know, drop it down on the floor a few times. And again, just be careful not to grab it too, too hard from here. That's fine for now. Uh, as you can see, we've got, we have a little bit, a little bit dirty just here, but the top, the top is mostly clean and it's still, still nice and crisp. You can see there, that's, that's exactly what we're going for. So we'll weigh the bag. 2.7 kilos, so that, that one's a bit over full. That one is a bit over full, but that's fine. I can calibrate, it's, um, so it's nine slightly less big scoops and that's, you know, that's close enough for my purposes. You can go 100 or, you know, 100 or 200 grams over or below is absolutely fine. Um, and it's just time consuming. It really is just time consuming. Like I said, you can get machines that do all of this for you, uh, baggers and all sorts of stuff, but you know, even th there are really good plans for DIY ones, which at some point, oh, yeah, look at that. Hello, unicorn. We've got holes in the bags from unicorn. Whoops. That's not good. How many of those? Another one. Holes in the bags. I'm going to have to send this video over to unicorn. What the hell? That is not good. It's three, four, Five, six, seven, Jesus, 
seven, eight, still with the hole. Oh dear. Um, well, I can't trust that one either. Still a little, that's nine. Oh, is this, no, I, put, I pulled that one from the bottom, okay. Wow, that's nine bags from Unicorn all that have a, have a hole in. Uh, I'm sorry to out you publicly like this, but that, that just happened. I did not plan that at all. Um, props to Unicorn though, they're, you know, they're a good company and I'm sure they will uh, refund me or something for that. That's not, that's not good at all. But they are good bags. They are the best on the market still, I would say, even despite that. So I can't remember what I was saying now. Um, can't have been that important. But yeah, it's just that was it. Yeah, so it's just it's just time consuming, more than anything. Um, you can get baggers, all kinds of machines, wet baggers, dry baggers. Talking and counting at the same time is uh, is quite hard. <laughs> um, but in my experience, you know, this this is fine. This is fine. Um, you know, I've been doing this, you know, two or three times a week now for oh, going on about six months, um, and you know, it's it's fine. Usually, I just chuck a podcast on, and put some tunes on or whatever, and and, and blast through it. It's you know, it's 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 nice. Um, you know, I'm pretty much at the limits of, of how much I can produce with this now, but, um, you know, it's fine. I don't mind, you know. And the thing is, is like if you gr mushroom growing is extremely labor intensive, like extremely labor intensive. So if you're like, you know, there are ways that you can automate things, definitely. And if you're like a, a wizard with electronics and stuff, then you'll, you'll be able to aut automate your way out of that fact. Um, if you're like me and like not so much, um, then you're just going to have to be prepared to uh, graft, graft non-stop, basically. Or pay someone to, you know, build the machines for you. Which is what I'll have to do eventually. a really good example you know very clean very clean look you know there's no detritus I guess is the right word on the uh, <coughs> on the collar of the bag and we can keep it like that all the way into the lab I'll, I'll show you how we can keep it like that all the way into the lab um, this green bit of plastic honestly saves so much frustration this is like one of my favorite if you put if, if, if I was to make a top 10 gear video this would definitely be in the list this thing it's wonderful this has been the same one I've been using since I started growing uh, well well basically since I started growing mushrooms yeah um, so obviously not going to film this whole thing so this is probably enough to do about 30 odd bags um, so you're not going to want to sit and watch the entire thing, I'm sure, unless you're really bored. Um, I guess the other thing to mention is as well, I've got these um, Corex sheets laid down. Um, the one underneath is, is wet, uh, the one on top here is dry and I, I always clean this down and keep it clean afterwards. Uh, the reason being, and you know, you're always going to get a bit of substrate on it. But the reason being is you're putting these bags down. Um, if, you know, if they're getting all sorts of dirt on the bottom of them, they go into the sterilizer. That the sterilizer will it will sterilize the dirt, but it's still dirt. Um, it doesn't, you know, the dirt doesn't disappear. It will just be sterile dirt basically. Um, and you unload that into your lab, and you get in, you know, you just coat in your lab in um, a layer of sterile dirt. But the, it's dirt that won't be sterile for long. Um, they're all little inoculation points for, for moulds and all those kinds of things. So, you know, you do it, you're always keeping the lab or wherever, wherever it is that you're doing your inoculation, that should be at the forefront of your mind when you're preparing these bags at all times. Um, 
and if you can just if you can be careful throughout the entire thing, you'll be fine. You won't have any problems. You know your sealer should seal the bags just just fine. Uh, there's a technique with the sealer as well. You know I'll do a little video on that, um, and you, you're going to have really fun times in, in the lab. Trust me, it's you know it's possible. You don't you don't need to spend loads of money. Um, so yeah, I'm going to crack on with this, and then uh, it will carry on filming with the. Um, and we fold the bags and load the steriliser. So we've got everything bagged up and now we're over on the uh, bagging station here. As you can see, uh, I've kept the tops crisp and clean as I mentioned earlier. Um, to excuse the noise in the background. So now it's, it's the next part of the process um, in, in, in terms of getting nice, crisp, clean bags for when we're in the lab that are gonna be nice and easy to work with. Um, so we've got the, the collars are still crisp, they're still clean, so you want to fold them down in a way so that they, they'll self-seal in the steriliser and they'll unfold when we want to inoculate them, they'll stand and then the heat sealer will, will seal, seal the edges you know, with a good, good solid seal that will, that will keep the air inside. So it's, the best way of doing it really is to just get a feel for it really, so you know, just try and even out the, uh, the substrate on the inside, just you know, make sure you've got nice crisp edges and then you want to, it's kind of like origami really in a lot of ways. So following the, uh, the gussets, I usually give it a little tap there in the crease, a little tap there, just to pinch it in and then, and then you can kind of just shimmy it down you see that still nice basically as it came out of the you know came out of the factory still and then you want to get it down to this point squeeze the air out and then i usually with your first fingers and your thumb pull the bag grab it pinch it underneath and then press down like that you'll hear air you'll hear air squeeze out of it um, and then it, that should, you pull it down like that then, and it should hold, hold its shape. Um, it will have sealed, so it won't be able to, it wants to expand, I've squeezed it in, it wants to expand and pull the air in, but because of the way the gussets are, and the way I've pinched it here, um, it's unable to expand, it's kind of, got, it's, it's already got a seal on it. So now, while keeping it pinched like that, you don't need to use a lot of pressure, I fold it, and also I should mention, always have the filter facing you, so then the filter is on the inside of these folds. So you fold it one, two, three times, and then flat against the block. I then turn it over, press it down, and it goes into the steriliser. In it goes. Okay, so I'll do a few more, just quickly. Um, just so you can see what kind of a, a speed you can get up to. I'm actually just watching the battery on my uh, audio recorder there because it's getting a bit low unfortunately. But yeah, so keep it crisp. You know, just slowly work the air out, follow the gussets, pinch it, and you'll hear a kind of, uh, it's like a trumpet sort of a, sort of a sound. So pinch it, you've got the seal, it's not expanding back out. You don't have to squeeze all the air out of it. Fold it, fold it, fold it, up against the bag, spin it over, grab it like that and there you go. Now the idea with it is, the technique really is you want to sort of So when, when you unfold these gussets, they'll, they'll unfold back up and they'll, they'll, come, they'll stand up like this. Now you imagine when you've got a bag, you know, you have it like that. You know, that's a nice, easy, you can tip your substrate into there quite nice and easily. Whereas if it was all stretched and warped, you know, I've had them where they come up, they're naturally just like this. You know, it's just a nightmare to get your, get your spawn into the bag, so. Start with the end in mind. Just do a few more and then I think I might um, bring the camera over here and do a little close-up. 
you just it really is just a you kind of just got to get a feel for it um, it takes a lot of practice it might look easy but um, you know I've done thousands of these things now and um, so uh, let's do a little close-up over here um, see if that's of any use to anybody we'll do a couple here as a close-up just see can you see that yeah that's good so okay so pinch again you just you just sort of move the bag around and just let it collapse in on itself it will guide you where it wants where it wants to go so pinch press maybe hear that air coming out of it that's what you want and then grab it you got your nice clean top there fold 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 in on itself constantly keeping it pinched keep the tension in the steriliser it goes we'll do one more as a close up Pinch, 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 pinch. Work with the bag. It's not, you know, it's, it's easy once you, uh, you know, once you know how to do it. And there, it's a bit uneven, so you can just, you know, give it a bit of a slap. There we go. And then fold, fold, fold. Fold. There we go. So, I'm actually going to bring it round to the steam steriliser. So, so inside the steam steriliser, I pack them this way with the uh, with the lids, with the uh, with like the tops up. Uh, we try and keep the tops away from away from the walls of the of the drum. Um, this last one will go in like this. Let's see if I can do it with one hand. So this last one just goes in like that and then folds. And so the bottom, the bottom layer go in with the. Uh, this one always, it always end, that last one always ends up being close to the edge there, but that's okay. It should be fine. Uh, and then all the next ones, the the, the tops will, will face down, but I'll, I will show that in a second. The next lot, so the next layer. So we have seven in a, in, a, in a row there. The next ones go upside down like this. And so I stack them so that that one sits on top of two. Um, and then you know, we just fill it up like that. So that's the uh, steriliser all loaded up. I could probably fit, fit another bunch of bags in here to be honest, but um, that's all I, was, uh, all I was planning to do today. Um, Yes, I better get a move on with this because I'm starting to run out of battery. So um, let's get this pushed over here. So now we'll uh, plug it in. There we go. And then grab the water mains. There we go, and we just tighten that off a little bit. Uh, this sends water off to the off to the steriliser and goes in through the float valve. Like I said, um, I only just emptied it. Um, I, I need to drain the water off. I'll do it. I'll do it on the after the next run. You want to switch the power on? Um, that will start heating up. We're going to get the lid, and away you go. So, uh, once your steriliser is filled up, uh, filled up with water um, and you've switched it on, um, I generally leave mine on for about 20 hours. So, uh, from the point of switching it on, um, I set a timer or I figure out you know, what time it's going to be the next day uh, and let it run for 20 hours. Uh, the reason being is uh, I've, I've measured it and um, it usually takes 10 hours for the, uh, for the centre bag to get up to, uh, get up to temperature. And then once they're there, um, and this is about 97 degrees I'm managing to get mine up to in here. 
Uh, once they're there, they want to be they want to be sterilised for ten hours, um, and and the theory goes that, that that's that's enough uh, to kill off, you know, kill off all of the uh, endospores and um, you know other things. At least enough to give your mycelium, um, you know, a head start so it can establish itself on the substrate. Um, Again, with these, this, you know, you might look at this and it probably looks a little bit daunting, but, um, you know, in reality, it was, you know, it didn't cost a lot. Um, I think in total, it was maybe 100, 120 pounds for the, uh, for the whole thing. It was, uh, I bought the, the drum from eBay, it was 80 quid. Uh, you know, the heating element, I think, is, is 20 pounds, something like that. And then the plum bits are just, you know, stuff I've sort of found laying around. It might have been a bit more, about 130 pounds, something like that, but... Um, you know, th there are plans online that you can follow. Um, so I think Eric Myers was the guy who came up with the design, um, and he's worked with a company called um, Bubba's Barrels in the States. Uh, and you can get one of those delivered, um, but it will cost you over two grand to get it imported. Um, so two grand versus 130 quid, you know, <laughs> it's a no-brainer, really. Um, the hardest bit, really, was cutting the holes in the side of the drum. Um, but you can get um, a step bit. You can get one of these. Um, it's enough to do the job. Uh, but anyway, I mean, I'll, I'll do a separate. I can do a separate video about the steam steriliser. Um, that's a whole other thing. The whole point of this video is to try to illustrate that you don't need lots of big machinery to grow mushrooms at a, a reasonable scale. Um, you know, everything that I've done there today, that you've seen me do today, you know, I can usually get done in you know, a couple of hours, it's a couple of hours hard work, uh, it's not, you know, it's not a big deal, you know, I can do that, you know, three times, three times a week, and that's, you know, it's a lot of bags, it's a lot of bags, so, um, yeah, I, I hope you found something in there useful, um, hopefully it's, so, so hopefully it's uh, helped point some of you in the, in the right direction, and uh, maybe stopped a little bit of the frustration in the process, because um, I, I know it can be, it can be frustrating sometimes. So, I'm planning to do some more of these videos. Uh, I think what I'm going to do is, uh, these, these bags that are in there now, I shall take them into the lab on Sunday, I think. Is, or, no, I'll, I'll take them in once they've cooked, and then I shall inoculate them on Sunday. So, I shall make another video about how I inoculate them in the lab then. And just, just take you through the process, basically. Um, take you on a journey with the mycelium. I uh, hope, again, I hope you enjoyed that. I hope you found something useful. And until next time, ciao!